I am here with Dr. Professor Ahmad Sadri, who is an Iranian-American sociologist, author, and translator, publishing in English, Arabic, and in Farsi. He is the James P. Gorder Professor of Islamic World Studies, as well as a professor of sociology and anthropology at Lake Forest College in Illinois, United States. Welcome. Um, I'm very happy to be here uh, with you and um, with your audience. What does it even mean to say that somebody is Persian or that somebody is Iranian? Are there differences there? Can we start with something simple like that? Yeah, of course, this is one of the questions that, you know, a lot of Iranians uh, uh, obsess about, and it's really not a big deal. Um, about a thousand um, BC or thereabouts, four groups of Aryans, four tribes of Aryans moved uh, from where the Aryans were, the Aryan uh, tribes uh, uh, lived, uh, they, they moved uh, in one um, wave to Iran, another wave to India, and the third wave went in, through the Europe, and it became the Indo-European basically migration that, that populated everything from Eastern Europe and Greece all the way to Scandinavia. And we know this through linguistic evidence uh, of the similarities of Indo-European languages. Not that we have any history of it, so it's kind of linguistic history. Um, the ones who came to Iran, there are four tribes. One was the Persians, one was the Medes, the third was the Parthians, uh, that became a dynasty after uh, the uh, conquest by Alexander, and the fourth were the Sogdians. So there are these four tribes. Uh, the first one to create an empire. Uh, or at least the uh, state was the Medes. And then uh, it, there was a kind of within family coup d'etat that led to the dominance of Persians over the Medes. So that is why Greeks re refer to Iran both as Medes and as Persians. So Persian is the name of that subtribe of the, uh, of the Aryans and the Medes as well. Uh, the languages are. Uh, rather similar uh, of all these four groups. And the reason that we were known as Persians is that at the time that Iran and Greece uh, were in contact from Cyrus the Great all the way to Darius III, the Achaemenid Empire, Iranian, Iran was dominated by the Persian group. Uh, but the Greeks also, also called us by Medes because that is not that far in the past. And then later on, the word of party, uh, 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 you know, uh, becomes prevalent uh, after the uh, generals of Alexander, uh, their rule of Iran uh, uh, ends and the Parthians take over. And this is a very interesting history in our Iranian um, uh, history that uh, spans about 250 years on each side of the common era. 200 BC 50 BC to 250 AD. That's a good way of remembering it, give or take, you know, uh, 10 years. And then the last dynasty that rules Iran and ends with, when the, with the Arab conquest is the Sassanid Empire. So when, when Alexander the Great dies and his general takes over and there's some kind of like Macedonian Greek leadership over Persia, it seems like that's when the Parthian Empire came to slowly take over. And yeah. what I'm looking at After history, I years, see. When, when Alexander dies, he's, because he didn't have an heir, his generals take over his entire realm. And some of them dominate the Asia Minor, and some of them dominate Iran. And so the ones who dominate Iran, they are the ones who uh, end up intermarrying with Iranians. Uh, and basically, we have a Hellenic um, dominance in Iran for 70 years. But then the Parthians rise and they wipe out the Alexandrian Empire. And there is still some, some Hellenic influence, but the Parthians are uh, uh, an Iranian, uh, Aryan um, uh, group uh, and they had their own empire and all uh, and and in this about 
500 years that they rule, they don't, unlike the Achaemenids, they don't build palaces and they are not into writing and they, they, there is scant evidence of what they have done. Um, in this sense, I think, because you and I are both interested in, uh, in Greek uh, analogies, uh, they are more like Spartans. They are not like Athenians. They are interested in warfare and they are interested in taking over and horse riding. They are into they are this kind of agonic and, uh, uh, and uh, feudalistic kind of dynasty. And then eventually they fade from the uh, scene and they are taken. Iran is then ruled by the Sassanid Empire all the way to the Arab invasion. Which so I want to ask you more about that. I have it in my notes that in 224, the Parthian Empire was overthrown by Adishir I, who began the Sassanian dynasty. But is the Parthian Empire Persian and Ardashir is also Persian? So it's different types yes, of they're Persian? Both Persian. They're, they're, they're both Persian, different, different groups of Persian. They're, hmm. So... Uh, with Sassanis, actually something interesting happens because they don't really call themselves Persian anymore. This is when the word Iran becomes very prevalent because Iran, Iran Shahr, means this Persian Iranian plateau. And within Iran, there are all kinds of different groups of people who live. They are like the Achaemenids. The Sassanians are very multicultural. And so um, the evidence of this is in the, the Epic of Persian Kings that was uh, re finished in 1010, uh, 400 years after the Arab invasion by Ferdowsi. And in Ferdowsi, uh, uh, what we find is the first like 9% of the epic poem is mythology, uh, similar to the Greek Theogony. Uh, and then uh, about 52% of it is epic. And this epic period is uh, basically reflects the Parthian dynasty that in Iran we call Ashkanian. Um, and then the last part of it, um, about 40% of it, uh, is, is history. And this history is only Sasanian history. And it starts with the transition of the uh, Ardavan, uh, to Ardashir uh, from uh, the Parthian, the last Parthian king, to the first Sasanian king. And so this part, of, this last part of Shahnameh is historical. And so that is what we have of that period. What's important is that the Sasanian dynasty was more interested in the Iranian unified uh, rule. And they emphasized Iran Shahr, which means the land of all Iranian groups. And so uh, the Persian uh, was a name that the Greeks gave to Achaemenes. Achaemenes didn't call themselves Persians. The Islamic Republic of Iran came from Iran. Iran came from Persia. Persia came from the Persian Empire out of Mesopotamia. So if you look at Mesopotamia, that's like 4,000 or more years ago, are the people who were going back to like Gilgamesh of Eric, if that was even a real story, pre the Achaemenid Persian dynasty, are those people also called Persia? Uh, I have names, if that helps. Uh, no. The dynasty so, of Akkad, Sargon, Lagash. Right. So basically, that starts, the first civilization that starts there is the Sumerians. And that is where the legend of uh, Gilgamesh uh, existed. These are, these are really an amazing people. They call themselves black-headed people. They are the ones who started writing, you know, writing uh, not only uh, as bookkeeping and, and necessities of the empire, but they started to write legends, and they started to write political treaties. And because of uh, the burning of their palaces, the um, all of the uh, clay tablets on which they wrote with cuneiform alphabet, uh, they were 
cooked and therefore they were preserved. So now we, we, are, we were able to decipher those. And the reason we were able to decipher the ancient cuneiform is because under the Achaemenids, when they wrote uh, on the side of the mountain, for instance, in Bistun, uh, near Kermanshah, they wrote in three languages. They wrote in Aramaic, they wrote in ancient Persian, and they wrote in cuneiform. And because the uh, Orientalists who were reading these, because ancient Persian is close enough to modern Persian to make sense, uh, uh, and because they knew Aramaic, then with those two, they put it together and they solved the puzzle of the cuneiform mm. alphabet. Uh, which is very interesting because the uh, Achaemenids uh, were very multicultural, as I said earlier. Uh, they were, you know, Achaemenid Empire, it was like America. They attracted, they att it was the first America. They attracted talent from everywhere. They, they, if you look at Tahta Jamshid or the Persepolis, you see the Greek art, you see the Mesopotamian art. So uh, the Mesopotamia, the first dynasty there, the uh, Sumerians, we don't know where they came from. We don't know if they were Aryans or, or they were, but their, their language uh, was probably not a Semitic language. With Akkad, Akkadian, and then uh, Babylonian, and then Assyrian empires, they had a Semitic language. So they are not, they, do, they don't speak an either European language, but they, they are Semitic civilizations. And they were very, very powerful at the time that Medes came along and they, they, they were big, big, com, big competitors and Medes were able to hold their own for a while until uh, 500 BC, Cyrus the Great takes over. And by all accounts, Cyrus the Great is the quintessential uh, leader. Uh, he gets great publicity in two sources. The Greeks love him and the writers of the Old Testament like him. So he gets great publicity in, in the Bible. Uh, he is the, the only non-Hebrew uh, king to be called uh, king, which is Messiah. Messiah means king. Uh, and so uh, the, uh, he is basically a servant of God in Deutero Isaiah, but he's also uh, very much admired by people like Xenophon, who was a soldier of fortune and worked for the Iranians, and even Herodotus and all of the Greek writers, they just absolutely adore um, Cyrus the Great as the greatest possible leader of humans. Um, uh, the Xenophon says, if I'm not mistaken, he says, up until Cyrus, we thought man is a good master of animals, uh, but not good master of man. Men, men cannot rule men, and obviously because the Greeks could never get along constantly, fought each other, and famously after the Iranian invasion, they fought each other in the Peloponnesian Wars for 27 years. So he says, we didn't know that man could rule man until we saw Cyrus, because with Cyrus we realized there is a talent, there is, it is possible for a man to rule man. So Cyrus is very much admired by everybody who wrote about him. It seems like Cyrus the Great is one of the first people who declared ethnic equality, religious equality. When he took over Babylon, he freed the Jews, he helped them go back to Jerusalem. And he's Persian and he's Zoroastrian. And True. then later, um, I guess he's 500 BC or so, later in like 400, there was another Persian king, Yazdegerard. Am I saying Yazdegerard. that right? That Yazdegerard is the last king of the Sasanian Empire, which is uh, defeated by the Arabs in about, you know, 630 or thereabouts. Mm. So he declared ethnic equality for the Christians, and he's Persian. And he was Zoroastrian, if I'm not mistaken. It looks like we have so many Persian kings that were very respectful, tolerant of foreigners, uh, Jews and Christians and Greek. We should uh, respect the historical context of these statements. So when we say Cyrus the Great was multicultural, was tolerant, uh, 
we should not use today's uh, concepts of tolerance and multiculturalism for a man who lived 2000 years ago. So obviously when Cyrus writes his famous a declaration in, in Babylonia. And this is one of the reasons that both Jews and Greeks really respect him. He's an innovator. And the way he rules over these populations is not by forcing them, but by absorbing them. And uh, so it, if you look at those Mesopotamian em emperors, the Assyrian emperors or Babylonian emperors, when they attacked another land, they would actually brag about their cruelty and they uh, disrespecting the gods and the temples, uh, they desecrating their holy sites. Uh, so they say, I am such and such a king, I'm Ashur Banipal, I went to this other group of people, I killed their men, enslaved their women, desecrated their temples and destroyed their gods, and that is who I am. Uh, but when Cyrus goes to Babylonia, actually he doesn't say, I'm a Zoroastrian, I'm, I'm here with a superior religion. He says, your, your gods called me to come. I am because your kings were cruel and, and they were terrible, uh, selfish people. Your gods called me to come and restore your religion. And he elevates their own priests. Uh, and this, is, this turns out to be actually uh, a very good way of keeping the empire, uh, creating an empire and keeping it by allowing those people to rule themselves, elevating rather than disrespecting their, their religion. Uh, he promoted their religion and allowed them to be who they are. Whether or not this is... Um, uh, what he intended by this, whether he really believed in multiculturalism or not, we don't know his mind, but we definitely know that this is an improvement over killing, massacring, and disrespecting, and, 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 and desecrating the temples. And so it is definitely an improvement. What, what is for sure is that it is very politically astute, because this way you can easily uh, not only conquer uh, foreign people, but keep them as your vassals, as your uh, allies. And uh, of course, when the time call, called for it, he was capable of cruelty. He was capable of, of, of conquering. But once he conquered the people, he sought to make allies of them. And this definitely is a, and this is what he does to the, to the Jews. And not only him, the uh, kings who follow him, Artaxerxes II, for instance, uh, he allows, when, when he conquers uh, Babylon, he, allow, he gives the Jews a choice. They can stay in Babylon, they can go back to Israel, and they can come to Iran. And they, and, and they, they, turn, they basically divide into three groups, as they wish. The ones who want to go back to Israel, they go there. The ones who remain in uh, Babylon, and the ones who can come to Iran. And they, they, uh, they are not the first group of Jews in Iran, they were Jews actually settled by the uh, Babylonians in Iran before the Achaemenids. But uh, so they are basically the really one of the ancient Iranian groups are the Jews who are brought to Iran, but a group of them come with Cyrus. And the ones who go to Israel, they find that everything is destroyed uh, and there is nothing there. And that is why the Iranian king sends Ezra, the who has a book in the Bible, also called the Second Moses. He, Ezra goes to Israel with funds from Iranian king to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and revive the Jewish religion in that part of the world. So uh, Jews of Israel remained basically allies of Iran because of these favors. Because of course, Romans who had turned Christian, they were persecuting the Jews and Iranians had, uh, the, and, and the Jews of of uh, that part of the world, that the ancient Israel uh, segment that the Romans had um, had conquered, they had great affinity for Iranians. So uh, that is the that part. But uh, the Sasanian king kings had a love hate relationship with the Christians because Christianity was after the Byzantine Empire starts was a religion of the uh, of, of of their rival, 
and they uh, used, uh, like all empires did at that time, they used their religion as a tool of domination. So uh, many uh, Sasanian kings had Christian wives, and they uh, allowed Christians uh, to flourish in Iran, but there was not always, you know, uh, roses. There was there were periods in which Christians were persecuted in Iran because of this tension between Iran and Rome. And so, but but by and large, the Christians were allowed to stay in Iran. Uh, uh, one of the problems was that the Christians of Iran were the Nestorian Christians, and the Constantinople. Uh, basically, Orthodox Christianity uh, did not uh, favor these Nestorian Christians. And so uh, there was, that was also part of the tension. But uh, mo by and large, the pre-Arab Iranian uh, identity was tolerant of different religions. What were the Arabian people before 620-ish when Muhammad has the vision from Gabriel. Were they Christian because of Rome or were they Zoroastrian because they were, of Persia? So, so this is very interesting. The Arabs uh, were uh, basically a totemic polis, polytheistic culture, like many of the tribal cultures. Each tribe had its own totems and they worshiped their own uh, deities. Um, one of these deities was this remote god now named Allah. So Allah actually existed before Islam. That is why Prophet Muhammad's father is Abdullah, which is the slave of Allah. Uh, so these Arabs existed and they, uh, some of them converted to Christianity and some of them converted to Judaism. The, the, the Arab Jews had an empire in Yemen, uh, a very powerful empire. And there were some Arab Christians. But Arabs did not want to convert to one of these two world religions because if they converted to Christianity, they would become all vassals of the Constantinople. And if they uh, converted to Judaism, they all would become the uh, would have to become the allies of the Yemeni uh, Jewish Empire. So that is why when Muhammad uh, re re receives his revelation of a new religion. This was a welcome uh, option for Arabs because now they could have a respectable um, bo uh, book religion. That was all the rage, you know, uh, these religions of multi, multi uh, you know, uh, henotistic religions of, of Arabia was the old hat. They wanted to have an advanced religion, but they didn't like to convert to Judaism and, and Christianity, Islam was a good choice for them because it was an Arabic religion and it was a religion of the book. It was an advanced religion. It was a monotheistic religion and it uh, gave them an identity and it did, not, it did not force them to become vassals of other powers. And uh, this, once they, uh, un they were unified and they were forbidden to fight each other, because the, the fighting was their way of life. That is how they lived. I mean, that was really, you know, the analogy to Greeks is very good. The Greeks were also agonic. They were into warfare and they could never unite because they were constantly fighting with each other. Um, like fighting cocks. In Persian, we call it khurus jangi, the fighting uh, roosters. They constantly are fighting each other. Islam unites them and forbids them to fight each other. So where, where should this way of life of, of warfare go? It turns inside out and turns against the two empires to their uh, west and north, the Byzantine Empire, of which they carve out like more than half of it, and they remain forever separated from the Roman Empire. And uh, then they invade Iran and take over Iran. Um, but I think we should note this, that they did this idea that they were, wanted to force people to become Muslims, that is inaccurate. Basically, what they wanted was conquest. And what they were after was two things, booty and slaves. So in North Africa, they enslaved hundreds of thousands of people. In Iran, mostly it was taking money. And, and in most uh, places, they just took money and, and walked away. 
Uh, there were very, very few mosques that they built in the first century. Why? Because they were really not interested in converting people. It was a conquest. And so, uh, but Iranians actually converted to Islam as people converted in many other parts, partly to escape the poll tax, uh, the, the jizya, but partly also to, to, to join the winning team. And actually, they went on to participate in the, in the further conquests. Um, a lot of the local people did that. Um, but the difference is that the areas of the Roman Empire conquered by Arabs, those people became Arabs. Egyptians became Arabs. Syrians became Arabs. Right? But Iranians did not become Arabs. They become Muslim, but they, they adopted the Islamic religion, but they did not adopt, uh, they did not become Arabs because they preserved two things. They preserved their language and they preserved their calendar. And those two anchors kept Iranians from becoming Arabs. Okay, I have two more questions. One thing you said was that it's basically a myth or inaccurate to have this perception of the Muslims as these groups of people who just conquered and forced people to practice Islam. Is there some similar misconception about Iranians? And two crucial things. Iranians kept their calendar. What does it mean? We have a solar calendar. The new year in Iran is the first day of spring. Nowhere else in the Islamic world you have the new year in any place other than in the in the uh, with the end of the Ramadan, right? That is uh, the end of the fasting month, which is a lunar month, ah, right? Okay. And it moves around the, the year because of the uh, the way lunar calendar works. Iranians use the lunar calendar only for religious occasions, you know, the birth of Prophet Muhammad or the beginning of Ramadan. But Iranian New Year starts exactly on the first day of spring, which is which goes back to Zoroastrian tradition, what goes back to Persian and Aryan tradition. And so uh, Iranians, uh, actually in a few days, on I think Thursday, we are going to have the celebration of the longest night of the winter solstice. Shabbat Yalda. 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 Uh, we have four occasions, four big celebrations. All of them are solar events. The beginning of spring and the beginning of fall are equinoxes. Day and night are exactly the same length. So Noruz and Mehrigan. We have the longest day of the year, Tirgan, the longest night of the year, Yalda. Yalda has, is actually the only one of them, that, them that, that doesn't have an Iranian name. The name Yalda actually is Aramaic. But uh, these four occasions, Iranians celebrate these. Although they are Muslims, they are celebrating what? They are celebrating pagan holidays, right? So they did not have to make these, these Islamized. They proudly and openly celebrate their ancient pre-Islamic uh, holidays. If there's Islamization, it's kind of very, very shallow, like reading an Arabic uh, incantation in Noruz. But that is, or putting a Quran on the Noruz spread. Uh, but actually, Iranians remain Iranians because they remain hooked into their ancient pagan religion, pagan, you know, Zoroastrian religion, pre-Islamic religion, because they kept their sad calendar. And they kept the language. They were very, very sanguine in keeping the la language. Around 300 years after the Arab invasion, you start uh, seeing these really great Persian poets cropping up all over the place. The last of which is Ferdowsi, that finishes, starts Shahnameh in 970 uh, AD uh, or Christian era and ends it in 1010. Uh, we are not entirely sure. He says 33 years, so probably 997 to 1010, but there are different uh, versions of Shahnama that he wrote. So in th 33 years, he writes the longest poem ever written by a single human being, Shahnama or Ep Epic of the Persian Kings. And this has three parts, the mythological part, the epic part that covers the, uh, the uh, Parthian, 
culture and and the historical part that covers the Sasanian uh, dynasty, and it ends with the Arab invasion. Now, this is written 400 years after the Arab invasion by a Muslim Iranian poet named Abul Qasem Ferdowsi. And uh, it definitely, it, it, it has 50 kings, starting from mythological, four mythological kings, from Qumart all the way to Ziazdegar III, with whom the entire poem ends. Uh, it's a magisterial poem, and it, it is an evidence of how, how uh, sanguine and how proud Iranians were of their own language. And the reason that you and I speak Persian the way we Ferdowsi did is probably because he wrote his magnum opus in Persian. Okay, last question. Last question. Is there one thing that you would want everybody in the West to understand about Iranians? Uh, I haven't thought about one thing uh, that I want people to know. I want people to know a lot of things, but I think avoiding this monolith uh, approach to other civilizations and other cultures is has also afflicted the understanding of Iran. Nothing is a monolith. Muslims are not a monolith. Iranians are not a monolith. You have to be more nuanced in your approach. You have to understand that Iran, Iranians are unique in the world for a lot of reasons. Number one is that they are an ancient people who have kept their connection to their ancient pre-modern and pre Abrahamic religions. We are because we kept our language and because we kept our calendar. So we are a combination of kind of an Islamic identity after we became Muslims and uh, and the pre-Islamic identity. We have kept them in in intention and and this is why the. Iran, being Iranian in Los Angeles, you know that Iranians are almost addicted to their culture, to their cuisine. Even second generation Iranians like you and, and many other people, uh, they are still very, very much interested in keeping in contact with their, with their ancient culture because all of this complexity, right. complexity is not always good, but I just love that Iranians are so complex, caught between their ancient, identity and their Islamic identity and their modern identity. Iran, to be Iranian is to constantly make compromises between those three identities. And so we are a very, very complex picture and people who try to simplify us, they do it at their own peril.